Hi, my name is Alexandra and I'm a bibliophile. Welcome back to a lovely jaunt where we read better, not more. Today we are wrapping up our discussion of the Song of Roland. So today is Friday. I hit my goal. I finished my book <laughs> unlike last week. And so I'm actually very happy. But of course this is like not a very thick book. It's a very slender volume. I like to say slender volume. Anyway, maybe we'll edit that out. In this section of the book, we're now getting into the sequence after Roland's death and Charlemagne is going to take revenge on the Spanish soldiers in order to take vengeance on behalf of Roland. At the beginning of this section, we learn that Charlemagne actually has the spearhead that was used to cut Christ's side, and he has it encased in the pommel of his sword, and that's part of this sort of maybe dispensation of authority, this dispensation of holiness that we see present in him as a sort of symbolic figure of God the Father here on earth. It also speaks to the epic and sort of legendary nature of Charlemagne. We already know that he has lived supernaturally a long time. And it also speaks to the importance of holy rec relics from this time as well. So holy relics were very important whether it would be the bone of a saint or a, a, a relic from Christ himself, a piece of the cross, a nail from the cross, that sort of thing. And so this was you know, very much tied in with that culture in the Christian church at this time. Charlemagne also gets many dreams. This actually happened before the death of Roland earlier in the story, and he gets another one now. He's gotten to the point where he's chased Marsilian, he's encamped with his soldiers, he's gone to sleep, and he gets more dreams. And it seems that uh, the angel Gabriel is his particular angel that he here see, gets visions from. It really speaks to his sort of like holy nature, the fact that he gets holy visions. It ties him in with a lot of Old Testament heroes, whether it be Moses or Abraham, like having visions and interacting directly with God in this sort of like Old Testament patriarch archetype, if you will. Balagant, another king, comes to the aid of Marsilian, and he basically pledges to fight Charlemagne in France. Apparently, he doesn't realize at this point that Charlemagne has actually turned around and is pursuing the Spanish army. On both sides, we have the repeated religious motivation for the conflict, and this just gets driven home over and over again from the story from the very first stanza to the end of Roland's life to Charlemagne over and over again, we see that the point is that it's a religious conflict, that it is this conflict that is bigger and is on this epic scale that's far beyond any one single soldier. Marcillian is about to die. There's a certain significance of him like losing his hand. I feel like that's important, his right hand. I'm not exactly sure what the religious if there's like religious tie in there, but you know, in my mind, of course, think of like Luke Skywalker and Star Wars being that this was written in the 1100s, I think that, you know, <laughs> the one we know which one inspired which. But I, I, I do think there's this sort of significance to this fatal wound, this loss of power. Maybe it's a symbol of his impotence, this sort of right hand of power, this right hand of righteousness, if you will. And cutting down his heirs also does the same thing, which Charlemagne has apparently um, killed both of his sons as well. So, which I think we did get earlier in the narrative. So we have this sort of double double symbolism of Charlemagne's power being stronger than Marsilian's power. So Marsilian agrees to pass the inheritance to Balagant if he can defeat Charlemagne. And then here we see sort of the interpretation of the dream that Charlemagne had is revealed, that the lion that came out of nowhere to attack him in his dream is probably symbolically representing Balagant, who sort of like comes out of nowhere to the aid of Spain. In the sort of like perfunctory, pragmatic, direct style of this poem, what we see is that the story moves quickly from event to event. So we have the flight of Marsilian, we have the arrival of Balagant, we have the death of Marsilian, we have the burial of Roland, we have the battle with Balagant. We kind of move clippingly through all of these events. It's absolutely an adventure story. But what this also means is structurally it's very hard to justify that the story should end when Roland dies. Even though Roland has been the focus of the first half, first two thirds of the story, 
it, you see how incomplete even from a structural perspective because it can, becomes like very hard to see like okay well where would you cut it off would you cut it off when he actually dies would you cut it off with the scenes of the french army returning which is sort of interspersed i forgot to talk about how anticipatory those scenes are as well would you cut it off you know with Marcellian fleeing, which, you know, we kind of just start moved from event to event to event, that there's no real clear wrap up and no real clear ending. And of course, this, this is because the main conflict, I'm repeating myself, I realize this, again, is on the sort of spiritual level, on the religious level. Now we get all of Charlemagne's troops in order, and this adds to the parallelism. Earlier, we got to see all of the Spanish lords listed out with their troops. Now we're going to see all of Charlemagne's lords listed out with all their troops. Again, hearkening back to that Iliad feeling of the catalog of the ships. Charlemagne prepares for battle with a humble prayer. He really kind of speaks to this religious tradition of God delivering his people. And we compare that with Roland, who was sort of like bloodthirsty and ready for battle with this haughty and overweening pride. Bring them on, you know. I wish I wish there were even more Spaniards for me to fight. And that kind of attitude. And there's a real strong contrast between these two men. And we see, of course, that the novel is commending the wisdom and the prudence of Charlemagne. Some of the pagan troops, and I'm using pagan in the term as, as used in the context of this book, in the context of when it was written, include giants, which recalls this sort of David and Goliath feeling. The enemy, you know, it has to be strong and powerful, even overly powerful, to prove the power of the relative gods. If this is really speaking to a, a symbolic spiritual conflict that is beyond the realm of the physical, and the physical is sort of emblematic of what is going on at this like higher plane, then we need sort of the enemy to be so very powerful that it would be supernatural for Charlemagne to be able to come back and defend himself and defeat him so that it can speak to the power of the god that he serves. Even down to Charlemagne's last hand-to-hand -hand combat conversation, the religious motivations come up again. The angel Gabriel sort of comes by his side and aids him, and it's very similar in style and language to the way in which the gods come along by the side of the Greek heroes and help them in the Iliad. Another theme that comes through is not to judge by appearances. Over and over again, we see certain Spanish warriors or Spanish lords sort of described that they would be a noble knight if he were not a paynim. And this is carried through also with Ganelon. The poem says, a man right noble he'd seem were he not false. And likewise, we see it also with the two representatives in the at the end of the story with the trial at the end, that one of them seems sort of like skinny and greasy and the other one who represents Ganelon uh, is handsome and robust and a strong warrior. Uh, we also want to break down the defense of uh, Ganelon. So now he the, the, the war has ended. Charlemagne has defeated the Spanish. Charlemagne has defeated the second king that came back. Ganelon is now in France and it's he's on trial for treason against France. Basically his argument runs like this. Roland wronged his estate we don't have any details here, and this could speak to the idea that this story was canon and part of a larger canon that the audience was clearly familiar with. They have background information that has been lost to time and that we don't have. So maybe the details here were known of some previous episode or conflict between Roland and Ganelon. The other argument is that Roland sent Ganelon off to be the envoy to Marsilian, the envoy for peace. And we know that Marcellian killed the previous two representatives, so he's arguing that Roland volunteered him to go as an attempt to kill him off. So he claims that it was vengeance, but not treason. We as the audience, however, we know the truth because we saw Ganelon make his own arguments to Marcellian back when he was talking with him. And the truth was that he was actively plotting and planning to kill Roland, not merely for his own vengeance, but because it would make the French army fall and uh, allow Marcellian the opportunity to, to win basically the battle. So it absolutely was also motivated by treason. The ending is quite interesting too. Instead of sort of a triumphant king at the end of this great battle, we see an old man who is tired of war, tired of battle. God is now going to call him up to another frontier, to another plane, to be his representative and to fight this holy war. And we see a man who is tired, who is sad. And so it's quite a sad ending for, for such a story. 
So, uh, that was really, really enjoyable. I really loved reading it. I found that once I got used to the poetry and I kind of got a sense of the rhythm and the beat, which is very strong and very consistent, it was really easy and enjoyable to read. It's a lot of adventure. There's a lot of action that happens. So it, in that sense, it's quite the page turner. Next up, I'm actually planning to read Angela's Ashes. It's a book that's been on my TBR. I think I actually got it for my brother because he had to read it for a class and I just like swiped it. Um, so sorry, Miles. <laughs> it's mine now. It's probably been mine for a long time now. Uh, but I've never read it. I've had it on my bookshelves for years and I've never read it. So we're going to read it together. It doesn't look to be horrendously long, but the font is small. And I'm like, the book is on the other side of my camera. But the font is small. I know I've like flipped through it a little bit. So I don't know how long it's going to take. With that, I was thinking of doing something like a sort of like free, uh, a, a, an alternative video every Friday. And I don't know if it would be like I could take an, an analyze a Sherlock Holmes short story. I love Sherlock Holmes. We could take a look at some folklore, myth, or fairy tales and analyze those. I'm thinking like something really short and sweet to break up the repetition that would come inevitably with me reading a longer book. I kind of felt that way a little bit with Emma where I was, I felt kind of pressured to rush through the book because I felt like I didn't, I didn't want to be too repetitious for my audience, but I still want to get out these, you know, videos every weekday. So I'm going to put a poll. Oh, it's probably over on this side. I always do it on the wrong side. I'm going to put up a poll in the corner and you guys let me know if you would like an alternative video every Friday whether you want to do Sherlock Holmes, whether you'd rather hear a fairy tale, or if you'd like me to do maybe some Norse mythology. So those will be the three choices there. Vote, let me know, and then we'll make sure to read that for next Friday. Until next time, my name is Alexandra, and I'm still a bibliophile.